Welcome. I'm Sandra Shuri. I'm a vice president at the California Healthcare Foundation, and I'm delighted to see you here today. Our CEO, Dr. Sandra Hernandez, had hoped to be with us this morning, but that uh, pesky virus that's impacting so many of our colleagues across the state has her at home. So you get the other Sandra to welcome you. So the California Healthcare Foundation is an independent philanthropy, and our focus of our work is to improve the healthcare system for the people of California. And our particular focus is low-income Californians. Our headquarters are in Oakland. We have an office here in Sacramento, and our work reaches across the state. Today's convening is one in a series of regular briefings that we sponsor for Sacramento policy staff and other interested people. The briefings are designed to bring you information that's relevant to key healthcare issues and trends and to promote dialogue on possible solutions to many of the challenges we face. In addition to those of you here in the room, we have over 525 people registered for the live webcast and 65 listening via phone. This is the largest turnout ever for one of our events, so welcome to all of you. At the end of this week, a video of today's session will be available on our website at chcf.org. Today's event is the first in a series of briefings we're doing on California's Medi-Cal program. We're calling the series Medi-Cal Explained, and its purpose is to raise up and broaden the Sacramento policy community's understanding of the program, who it serves, and how it operates. Today's program is the basics, and it's targeted to those with only a rudimentary understanding of the program. We decided to offer this Medi-Cal Explained series because the Medi-Cal program is so important to people across our state, and we believe the best policy making and implementation of any program occurs when people from a diverse cross-section of communities, interests, and perspectives share a common understanding of how the program works. One of our uh, little mottos around the CHCF offices is, we don't want to argue about the facts, we want to argue about what the facts mean. So helping everyone understand the basics of Medi-Cal serves that broader goal that we have. Medi-Cal is an amazingly important program, touches people from the very top of our state down to our southern border. Um, it touches families and children, as you'll hear, low-wage workers, people with disabilities, people with mental illness and substance use disorders, and many low-income seniors. The care is delivered in every kind of delivery system you can imagine, and you'll hear more about that. Community health centers, public hospitals, schools, nursing homes, specialty mental health and addiction treatment facilities, and a variety of other settings. Medi-Cal's a federal program, so we have to care about what the federal government thinks. It's a state program, which gives us policy options here at the state level and also a local program, so it means the state works in partnership with the counties. A program with so many benefits, services, and players is naturally going to be complicated. Our intent with this series of briefings that will all be branded Medi-Cal Explained is to make sure that more people understand the basics of the program, can then think about how to drive improvements in it and be supportive of it. Um, we have in your, form, in your packets little yellow pieces of paper. If you are listening today and you say, I hope they include X topic in a future part of this series, please write it down there or look for anyone with this really swell lapel pin on, that's CHCF, and grab them and tell them, gee, I really want to learn about the X aspect of the Medi-Cal program. We'll try to do that. I want to mention, because uh, this is a longer uh, time frame than we usually use at CHCF, that our last session, we're really uh, delighted to have Jennifer Kent, the director of the Department of Healthcare Services, joining us to give us a little bit of a look forward on Medi-Cal. So I'd encourage everyone to stay tuned all day. 
Um, and we also really appreciate the participation of so many of our partners in today's program. We have people from the Insure the Uninsured Project, from Health Management Associates, staff from the Department of Healthcare Services, the County Welfare Directors Association, and it's just a, a great agenda. I'm so delighted that so many really um, brilliant people on the different aspects of Medi-Cal agreed to participate. Christoph Stremikis, who I hope you all will uh, meet today, leads CHCF's market analysis and insights team. And he's going to start the briefing with an overview of some of Medi-Cal basics. And uh, then he'll serve as the master of ceremonies for the rest of the day as we take a deeper dive into just a few of the topics. So welcome again, and please join me in welcoming Christoph to the stage. Thank you very much, Sandra. Uh, my name is Christoph Stremikis. I'm the director of the Market Analysis and Insight Team at the California Healthcare Foundation. Um, before we begin, uh, I, I was reflecting this morning on uh, two things that seem to recur frequently uh, in my time working in California healthcare policy. And this project, which is an attempt to capture and communicate the basics of a $100 billion program that provides care to so many Californians has only reinforced uh, and required both of those. Uh, the first is a feeling of humility. So any attempt, including today's, to fully explain and capture uh, Medi-Cal is always gonna fall short. The best I think we can hope to do, and our main goal for today's session, and that material that Sandra referenced in your packet, is to provide the beginning of an overview of key program features and some of the many policy issues and opportunities facing the program in the near term. As Sandra mentioned, uh, we really hope you find this session and that material useful, but if there are specific topics or material that you'd like to see in future briefings or publications, we really do want to hear about them, and we want to make this new series that we're launching today, the Medi-Cal Explained series, as useful to you as possible. The second feeling that recurs to me frequently when uncovering the basics of Medi-Cal is gratitude. Uh, Sandra mentioned uh, some of these organizations, but certainly there are many organizations and individuals dedicating themselves uh, to improving this program, which is making a material difference in the lives of so many different Californians. I've listed several. Um, uh, Sandra also mentioned uh, some of them. All of these folks played a key role in helping us articulate features of the program. They reviewed draft after draft after draft after draft after draft of the material. They served as informal and informal, informal and formal advisors, and sometimes they were just cheerleaders. Uh, we and I needed them all, and thank you all for everything you've done. Humility and gratitude are also two feelings that I frequently find myself having, having when interacting with CHCF staff as well. I want to express my appreciation for the team at CHCF and Golden State Health Policy for all their work on this project. Without the folks you see up here on the screen, and many of whom you don't, we wouldn't have such great panels lined up today. We wouldn't have uh, the new resources in your packet. And uh, very importantly for me and all of you in a four-hour session, we wouldn't have such a wonderful lunch lined up at 12.30. So thank you all for that. As Sandra mentioned, um, I'd encourage all of you to take a look at this new Medi-Cal Explained series. An awful lot of the material is in your packet. Um, it was, uh, with a crucial assist from the advisory group, um, we're beginning the series with a landscape overview document, and then we have four new fact sheets in key areas like the Medi-Cal budget process and health plan payment. We also have a new version of our very popular Medi-Cal Facts and Figures Almanac, which my colleague Robin Gaines produced to help us further understand the people, finance, and organization of the program. All of these resources and a curated set of some of the other material produced by the robust Medi-Cal community we're so lucky to have here in California um, are and will be available on our website at chcf.org slash mc explained. So what do we have on tap today? Uh, we have three great panels on the who, what, and how of the Medi-Cal program. Who is the program serving? What is it covering? and how is it being financed. Each panel is gonna include a 15 to 20 minute overview of the basics, followed by about 15 minutes of thoughts on key policy and activities that already have or will be emerging in the next one to three years. 
and then we'll have some time for audience Q&A at the end of each panel. After lunch, as Sandra mentioned, we're so fortunate to be joined by DHCS Director Jennifer Kent and CHCF's Chris Perone. Both of these folks will provide their thoughts and perspectives on the future of the program. Before we begin, though, let me provide just a few reminders of why Medi-Cal is so important to California and why we're so fortunate to have the time together today to discuss it. Some of you may have seen the recent poll that CHCF and the Kaiser Family Foundation released last month, but for those that haven't, it quantifies just how important and popular this program is across the state. In fact, more than nine in 10 Californians believe the program is important, and strong majorities have favorable opinions of how it's operating. This support cuts across party, sociodemographic, and geographic lines. In an era when it sometimes seems like so many of us disagree on so many different things, there is broad agreement in this state that Medi-Cal is working and it's very important to all of us. At least part of that strong support is probably due to the first major theme, the first of five themes that I think you'll hear again and again today. That is, Medi-Cal covers a tremendously broad and diverse group of Californians. Margaret Tater is going to speak more to this in our first panel, but nearly one in five working Californians, half of California's children, one in three of those seeking support for mental health, all rely on Medi-Cal. Over one million elderly adults, almost 200,000 veterans. In our recent poll, almost 60% of the state reported the program is personally important to them and their family. And a Kaiser poll released last February found that 70% of people nationwide say they, a close friend or a family member, have received help from Medicaid at some point. Seven out of 10 people. Clearly, this is a program that touches and supports so many of us here in California. Now I'm on the right slide. Californians may also believe Medi-Cal is important because they recognize the financial impact it has in our state is quite large. Uh, and on this slide, you'll see that the Medi-Cal budget is literally quite large. Lindy and Scott will talk more about this in our third panel today. They'll speak about the sources and flows of these funds throughout the system, but it's worth keeping in mind the consequence of all these dollars. Put simply, Medi-Cal is a tremendous $100 billion infusion, as Sandra said, of local, state, and federal money into our safety net delivery system. It's a large and growing portion of our state budget. Scott will speak to this. Yet I'd argue it's unrivaled in its efficiency, providing coverage to more than 13 million Californians. Related, Medi-Cal has become the backbone, woven into the fabric now of California's healthcare system, and it intersects with almost any health or so social service program or issue we or our organizations are focused on. JC will talk about this, but it covers a broad range of primary, specialty, and acute care. It covers long-term care, it covers mental health, it covers prescription drugs, certainly something we've been hearing a lot about lately. Through its demonstrations and pilots, which both JC and Deborah will discuss in our second panel, it's changing the way care and services are delivered here in California. It's central to major policy issues and priorities like children's health and early childhood development, homelessness, the opioid epidemic, to name a few. It can use its tremendous purchasing leverage in this and other priority areas through initiatives like Smart Care California and the upcoming Managed Care Procurement Cycle. I'm sure we'll hear more about both of these this afternoon. Fourth, I'm also certain that we'll hear and see an awful lot of data today. As I mentioned, my colleague Robin has curated a significant amount of this in the Facts and Figures Almanac that's available at the back of the room and on our website. Medi-Cal is important because it generates all this data. This is data that's singular in its ability to help us understand and monitor the health and well-being of low-income Californians and just how they're interacting with the care system. It points to areas that may need attention, such as access to specialty and mental health care services, and promotes accountability within the program through initiatives like the Access Monitoring Plan and quarterly managed care performance dashboards. In some areas we discussed today, we have a lot of data, but in others we're just beginning to uncover and explore the unique data the program alone is capable of generating and disseminating. And finally, Medi-Cal is particularly important right now because the program and the environment in which it operates is undergoing such significant change. We're gonna hear more about this in all three panels in our discussion after lunch, but the impact of coverage expansion, waiver expiration, any exogenous change in the political or economic environment, these are all gonna be important issues that we'll need to address over the next several years. Other pressing changes we're likely to hear about both today and the near future include things like 
How might policymakers change the financial incentives that Medi-Cal managed care plans face? I know my colleague Chris has been working with stakeholders on this for the last several months, and he'll have some thoughts to share this afternoon. Other challenges include how might we get the half a million people eligible for Medi-Cal but not enrolled in the program into the program? How can we continue to promote behavioral and physical health integration? How can we ensure there are enough health care providers to serve Medi-Cal beneficiaries whenever and wherever they need care? These are just some of the many challenges and changes in our near future, and this change is yet another reason the program, this series, and our discussion today is so important. People, budget, backbone, data, and change. Five things. I think we're going to hear these themes again and again today. But let's get started with one of the most important, the people that Medi-Cal supports. Speaking of people, I think we're very fortunate to have two of the best folks that I know uh, help us explain who Medi-Cal covers and how they enroll. I'd like to welcome Margaret Tater from Health Management Associates and Kathy Senderling from the County Welfare Directors Association up to the stage. Margaret and her team helped draft a majority of the material you have in your packet today, and she'll get us started with an overview before we turn to Kathy for a discussion of some policy issues. Please join me in welcoming Margaret and Kathy. Sorry, I think if you just like that. Great. Okay. Great. Thank you. A uh, warm thank you to everyone at the foundation, particularly Christoph, uh, Sandra, Chris, for the opportunity to collaborate on this project. It meant a great deal to us uh, at HMA to be able to participate this way, and it means a great deal to us uh, to be involved in this kind of collaborative to improve and enhance our mutual understanding of a program that now serves one in three Californians. So it's um, also particularly delightful for me to share the podium with Kathy. Uh, we have worked together a lot over the years, um, and uh, it is my great honor to be partnering with her today with you. So again, in connection with the who, who is eligible for Medicaid, we're going to talk very, very briefly about that on a high level today for purposes of our explainers. But I would just urge you to think and take a step back and remember that Medicaid started in 1965. 1965, many of you weren't even alive. Some of us were. We remember Medicaid in its origins as a welfare program that primarily served moms and kids. Over the years, we have added populations. The program has become more critical in terms of serving as a health insurance program. And at this particular juncture, I think when you walk away today, you'll realize not only has Medicaid, Medi-Cal, moved dramatically from serving moms and kids, we are now full service insurance program for all sectors of the population, but we're also a critical health insurance program that knits together so many aspects of health care and social services needs for a critical population that we in California have a great deal to be proud about insofar as our Medi-Cal program serves a third of our state. So the Medi-Cal population, as I indicated, um, is the largest one in the country. We serve 13.2 million Californians, a third of our population. And by categories of aid, we have um, an insurance program for low-income children, persons with disabilities, seniors, adults as a result of the optional expansion program, and then for low-income seniors who get Medicare, Medi-Cal wraps around those services to provide much needed supports to prevent early institutionalization. Who is covered by Medi-Cal? This slide really attempts to demystify, if you will, the uh, policy language, the policy jargon, which is, of course, um, attendant on all things related to the Medi-Cal program. This attempts to depict very plainly the people that Medi-Cal serves and, and covers. So again, one in five working families is covered by the Medi-Cal program in California. As Christoph sent, said at the beginning, um, Medi-Cal covers half of all of our children. Half of all of California's children are covered by the Medi-Cal program. And I think you'll hear more today and later on in the series just how critical those programs are in Medi-Cal for children related to their 
early screening and developmental needs. We cover seniors, we cover um, persons with disabilities, one in three Californias, uh, Californians in need of mental health services access those services through the Medi-Cal program. So again, a program that initially started years ago as a very relatively narrow program for moms and kids serves all segments of our California family. This slide depicts uh, the aid category, enrollment by aid category. So again, as Kathy will talk about, eligibility is determined through a fairly complicated array of factors that determine either financial need, categorical need, et cetera. But this, when you boil it down, captures the categories of persons who are in fact covered by Medi-Cal as of 2018. So you can see, again, the preponderance and the, the, the numbers of folks, seniors and persons with disability in that dark purple. CHIP is the Healthy Families Program that served uh, children that was transitioned into the Medi-Cal program a few years ago in 2013. We have parent caregiver and and um, and children, 39%, again, reflective of the fact that Medi-Cal historically was a program that served moms and kids. But the really interesting thing about this slide is in green. So in green, we have the ACA expansion. As you all know, California expanded, took advantage of the option under the ACA to expand the Medi-Cal program to cover childless adults. We did that and saw a very significant uptick in eligibility and enrollment in the Medi-Cal program to again serve working families. This means that again when you look at that slide and look at the fact that we now have working adults, working families in the Medi-Cal program, this is a program that serves all segments of our population. And it's a dramatic difference, thanks to the ACA, that we have been able to, again, develop and move and improve the program to be of service across the spectrum. This depicts the, again, beneficiary profiles by race and ethnicity, and then um, by the primary language spoken by beneficiaries. So again, you have a preponderance of people on the language side, a preponderance of people indicate that they speak English as their first language, um, and then Spanish is second at over 30, almost 35%. Um, then on the race ethnicity side, we see the breakdown of the categories of members served by the program by race and ethnicity. Again, what you look at when you see this from the California perspective is that this program serves a highly diverse population, a highly diverse population in terms of their race, ethnicity, cultural norms, and access to um, social services. So again, when you think about the program and its nimbleness to serve this swath of membership, it's a testament to what California has done in creating, refining, and enhancing this program over the years. Uh, this is a beneficiary profile by age and gender. Again, when you look at the age segment, Again, thanks to the ACA, we see that age segment very significantly changing the fact that Medi-Cal is now an insurance program that cuts across all segments of the population, no longer moms and kids. The, be the, the beneficiaries are working families, childless adults in that age bracket. So I think that when you begin to listen to folks who are talking about the Medi-Cal delivery systems and how responsive the Medi-Cal delivery systems are, 
I hearken to Christoph's comments at the outset that there is no segment of the California healthcare delivery system that has not been impacted and in my view positively impacted by the Medi-Cal program. This tells you part of that story. Medi-Cal now serves the entire state in terms of population levels and as a result our delivery systems are deeply impacted by the fact that this is the who of who we serve. Uh, for Medi-Cal eligibility, I'm going to run through this, but I'm going to defer to my partner, Kathy. Um, so eligibility is based on household income, finances, citizenship, residence, of course, in California is a requirement. Um, the counties serve a very significant role in the eligibility determination process. And again, I'm going to save time in the presentation and have Kathy walk through that because her knowledge of this is peerless. Um, this shows the income thresholds by funding source. So again, um, membership is categorized in these buckets of membership on the um, long axis, and then you can see the percentage of federal poverty level up to 226% of federal poverty level that the Medi-Cal program covers. Again, I'm going to defer to Kathy on some of these details um, in terms of premiums and cost sharing, but as Christoph said, and I think you'll hear from Kathy, what we have in California is a singularly efficient Medi-Cal program and delivery system in terms of the eligibility process that Kathy will describe, and then the delivery system about which you'll hear more in the afternoon, all geared to um, a demonstrably effective program for the WHO, which we're talking about this morning. So Medi-Cal uses, in broad brush, a cascading eligibility determination system that allows applicants to go to their county welfare director or county social services agency. And again, there's no wrong door. Applicants go to the county. They provide their information, their financial information, asset information, et cetera. And then the county eligibility systems um, can, can determine uh, eligibility um, and Presumptive eligibility is also available for certain categories of beneficiaries. Again, the idea is that there's no wrong door from an applicant perspective. What happens then is that beneficiaries, and if you look at that arrow across the bottom, once eligibility is determined, the um, notice goes to healthcare options. Healthcare options is run by the Department of Healthcare Services, and healthcare options is the entity that promotes and ensures access to choice for those beneficiaries who are going to be served by managed care. So choice forms go out from healthcare options, beneficiaries then pick a managed care plan or have one picked for them if there's a default and they don't choose, and then they get notices from that plan and engage with that plan to ensure that their care is delivered. So at this point, I think I'll take it back to these slides and turn it over to Kathy. Thank you very much. Thanks, Margaret and Christoph, for the introduction as well. Hi, everybody. I'm Kathy Sunderling McDonald with the County Welfare Directors Association. Just a couple quick things about CWDA if you've not worked with us before. Our association is a nonprofit and we represent all 58 county human services agencies. So, in addition to doing initial and ongoing eligibility for the Medi Cal program, our members also run the CalWorks Welfare to Work the CalFresh, formerly known as Food Stamp Program, Child Welfare, Foster Care and Adoptions, and um, a, several programs for adults, including an Adult Protective Services Program and an In-Home Supportive Services Program that is also um, part of the Medi-Cal program and uh, growing substantially as our population ages as well. So um, you heard that one in three Californians are enrolled in Medi-Cal. At any given point in time, our members are serving more than 
one in three Californians through one of these programs that I just ran through. So it's a, it's a pretty significant task, and we appreciate being included in, in today's conversation. So I'll talk a little bit about why the counties run Medi-Cal and how that's structured from a couple different angles and then talk about some key issues that are facing us in terms of eligibility and enrollment both within the county systems as well as some places in which we touch other elements that you'll hear about today and probably in future uh, trainings and sessions as well. So. Um, Back in 1965, as Margaret noted, the county human services agencies already existed, and we ran things like almshouses for the poor and um, basic sort of welfare programs for the individuals in our counties. And so when the state created Medi-Cal, and wanted to implement this new Medicaid law at the federal level, they housed it within the county human services agencies. So that's by state law. And then also, by federal law, merit systems employees or public employees um, have to be the ones who make these eligibility determinations. That's the case for other programs like the CalFresh or food stamp program as well. So it's, it's sort of started there 50 plus years ago and remains there today. We have a network of eligibility workers in each of our counties. We have well over at this point, I think 20,000 who are dedicated to Medi-Cal. The numbers are a little fuzzy because in some counties they also cross train to CalFresh. Uh, it's very common, it's our sort of second largest benefit program that someone applying for Medi-Cal also wants to be considered for the CalFresh program or vice versa. So um, a, a number of counties have kind of structured it that way. The CalWorks program is a little bit smaller and you don't tend to see that as, as often coupled with the other programs because it has some additional eligibility rules and requirements that go beyond the Medi-Cal and CalFresh programs. So they tend to have sort of separate eligibility determinations for that program, but a lot of connection between Medi-Cal and CalFresh in particular. So um, those eligibility workers are the ones that our um, applicants primarily interact with, but also, as you know, and growing in recent years through the ACA implementation, um, a lot of our applicants interact, at least initially, with computers. We created, at the county level, online application systems that connected into our computers. Um, on Margaret's slide, you saw SAWS as the acronym. That's called the Statewide Automated Welfare System. And though it says statewide, there are three systems that the counties are currently using. Each county is on one system, so they don't use more than one per county. But those systems created online, back when the internet was still rather young, it's been almost, I think, well over 15 years that um, individuals have been able to go online and submit applications for our programs online. That was really enhanced, I think, through the ACA over the last six or seven years with the creation of the CalHERS system, which is probably you would know it more as going to CoverCalifornia.com and using that system to apply. What backs that online portal that you see up is a system called CalHERS. And so our SAWS systems interface with the CalHERS system. And um, our workers primarily use the SAWS system that their county utilizes. They don't use the CalHERS system. It's more of kind of a little engine for them, running the rules for somebody. They pull that case into SAWS, house it there, and finish up the eligibility, and then do case maintenance, which happens all year long, in addition to annual redeterminations that every person has to do at least once every 12 months. We use our SAWS systems primarily for that calling out to the CalHERS system when we need to. So that's kind of our eligibility workers interacting with automation that has grown up and grown more substantial and more powerful over time to be able to get what is now over 13 million people onto the program. The process for that um, is manifold. I think you saw no wrong door on Margaret's slide, and that's correct. Um, someone can come in person to the county. We have offices in every county, but you don't have to. The online applications, as I mentioned, are there and available for folks, as well as calling and just talking to somebody on the phone to get that application started, or much less utilized but still available is the mail-in process. Um, 
when we were implementing the Affordable Care Act, there was a lot of discussion about how many people would shift and do the phone or online. And that has been a large take up, especially among younger users. What we found is that um, if someone is a little bit older, if English is not their first language, they're much more inclined to come in person to the county offices. So maintaining those offices has been really critical to be able to serve all of our community members in a, in a good way. The, so when you apply, um, the county has 45 days to process that application. The CalHERE system is robust and it can run rules pretty quickly. So you might find out instantaneously that you're eligible for the program or you might, might need to get followed up by a county worker to ask some additional questions and it can tell that person right there. Um, once a person is found eligible, like I said, they essentially get 12 months of eligibility. They are uh, able to come in during the course of that year. I had a baby. Um, my kid is now 22. They just graduated from college. What should I do? My income changed. They can come back anytime, and they do, to have their eligibility relooked at. When that happens, under the Affordable Care Act, we're now able to reset them for another 12 months. So it can kind of get pushed out for some people if they come in during the course of the year for a longer period of time and just kind of roll that eligibility forward, assuming that they and their family members are still eligible. So that was a really important change that we got from the um, Affordable Care Act. The other thing that changed um, and is now the case today, as um, Margaret noted, is um, we have eligibility that is much broader for individuals who don't have children, who are in that sort of 18 or 21 to 64 age group. Most children we think of 18 as sort of you become an adult. In Medi-Cal, for the most part, 21 is the break point. So kind of 21 to 64 is the group that you'd think about. Um, Prior to the Affordable Care Act, if you were a parent of a child, we could find you eligible, but only if we applied, in addition to the income test, also an asset test, which would include things like your bank account, like you'd think, of, think it would, but it includes things all the way to um, do you have a burial plot and how much is that worth? I kid you not. So those old school 50-year-old rules were applied to parents, and if you didn't have a child and you didn't have a disability, you were just out of luck. You didn't get onto Medi-Cal. So now non-disabled, non-parents in that six, 21 to 64 um, age range are able to enroll as well. And what's great about the Affordable Care Act is they don't have an asset test, and now neither do the parents. So we eliminated that for the new Affordable Care Act coverage. It's important to understand that um, not everybody is eligible under the rules of the new Affordable Care Act. And so what we did um, here, and I'm assuming other states as well, but in, in our state, we created sort of, here's the Affordable Care Act, which is like the broadest coverage. This is that cascading process that Margaret alluded to. You're most likely now in California to be eligible under those rules, so we check them first. And then if you're not eligible under those rules, we're gonna go to the old rules. We're gonna go to the old programs that existed before the ACA, and they are still in our computer system. They're hanging out in saws, just waiting to do their thing for those people for whom the first initial eligibility that CalHERS does says, nope, they're not eligible. Well, we're gonna go check everything else. We may have to ask them about their assets still, but it could be worth doing that to get the coverage to be able to have the health care covered by the program. So we maintain those rules even though so they're clunkier and they take a little bit longer to figure out because they can benefit some people and we do still have individuals who are enrolled under all of those system, all of those programs. Um, it was kind of funny because I think when the Affordable Care Act happened, we thought we had every program has what's called a set of aid codes. And those are all programmed into the computers and everybody thinks about aid codes. And we thought, yeah, we get to get rid of the aid codes. And in fact, we added aid codes primarily under the Affordable Care Act, so we have more now than we did. And we, th <clears throat> we thought, yeah, we're streamlining everything. That's gonna be the shortest application you ever saw in your life, and that's not true. If you look at the paper application, it's still pretty significant. Or if you, or if you've helped someone in your family or your community apply, it's a pretty, it can be a pretty long process, but it is worth it. And I think the studies that um, this foundation and others have sponsored show people really value the coverage that they get. It is worth, you know, kind of going through the steps to get the coverage, and we've tried to streamline it as much as possible. <clears throat> so, a few other thoughts um, before I kind of get into the, um, the sort of what are the hot topics. First, I would say um, it is still, like I mentioned, a pretty complex program. In addition to the application being streamlined as much as possible, but not 
like reduced to two pages or anything like that. There are some differences in the different programs related to um, who's in your household. Um, the Affordable Care Act looks at a tax household. So who's filing the taxes together? And we base that income, we base your household off of your tax filings. In the sort of older programs that I mentioned, um, it's a different calculation. It's about who are you supporting, who is your dependent, but not necessarily from a tax perspective. What income counts can differ across programs as well. Um, and so there's a manual, there's a lot of rules about that. We program the computers and especially the front facing system to try to be as clear as possible to folks. Here's the type of income I'm talking about. Here's what I'm looking for when I'm asking you these questions. We also look, like I said, at assets, but only in the older programs, not in the Affordable Care Act programs. So that's why we look at those first. And then in addition, we look at your immigration status. And I will address as a hot topic or kind of thing that we're working with right now, immigration. Um, but it matters if you're a lawful permanent resident, how long you've been, and, or if you're an undocumented person in the state um, or a citizen, you get different levels of coverage. Primarily today, um, we largely cover folks who are here legally. Uh, some of that is through a state-only program that we've created in, in, here in California. If you're undocumented, if you're a child, SB 75 allows you to receive what's called full scope coverage. But anyone in the adult category or older adults are able to receive what's called emergency services or limited scope. And that doesn't mean you just get to go to the emergency room for any sniffle. It means an emergency that is an urgent issue that you could become severely uh, impaired or die from. It's a pretty narrow description of what is covered through that. So that expansion in SB 75 that is also now proposed to be expanded to the young adult population through the governor's budget is critical because it significantly expands the services that those individuals are eligible for, and I'm certain that the continual the discussion will continue. Well, what about the slightly older adults? What about elders? Uh, I think you'll likely see that in um, the legislative discussion. So, a few of the other <coughs> kind of hot topics that I wanted to mention. Um, sort of writ large and thinking about kind of the discussions that we're going to see, in addition to that immigration expansion issue. I think we're seeing a growing and continued understanding of how intertwined health and human services and someone's living situation and the issues that they face is with their health uh, and well-being and the health care that they receive. Um, so we think in our world about nutrition affecting health in significant ways, so trying to make sure people are eligible and enrolled for um, the services that they receive. Physical and behavioral health and the intertwining there between those systems and making sure that you're able to receive coverage for both of those. As well as homelessness and housing security, kind of the issue of the day. If you're couch surfing, if you're living in your car, if you're in a park sleeping on a bench, you are not going to be very healthy at this point. And so thinking about how do we direct resources toward affecting the housing of people to enable them to also be healthy is a really important discussion that we're seeing more and more. And I'll also have some proposals in the governor's budget about. I'll mention, um, I think an ongoing conversation is the workload associated with that 13.2 million people. Pre-ACA, we had 9 million people on Medi-Cal, and we still, you know, our eligibility staff, they're amazing, but they can't get everything done in a day. And while we did work with the administration, both under the Schwarzenegger, Brown, and then now um, that we'll be working with the Newsom administration to receive additional funding for additional staff, I think we see that they still leave and they can't get everything done in a day. In particular, <clears throat> right around the end of the year, which is when people started being able to enroll for the Affordable Care Act several years ago, we see a huge bump. It's like a pig in the python. So many people have their annual redeterminations or they move from the Covered California programs into Medi-Cal. I mean, we, can't, we don't need to staff up at that level always because we don't see that, that level of work. But there's about a three-month period where our folks instantly get slammed. There's immediately a backlog. And so figuring out how to smooth that out and really work through those in, a, in an efficient, effective way is really critical. Um, automation improvements, you know, I mentioned the SAWS systems. There's three systems right now. The, we're actually in the process of migrating to one. The um, time frame for that is early 2023 at this point. 
what will be happening is um, the Los Angeles system, which is the newest one and is only used by that county, will have about 30 counties added into it that use a similar but older system. That's sort of step one. And then you're going to have about 20 additional counties come in and finish that out at, um, the, in that early 2023 level. And then everybody will be on one system. So that'll make data pools easier for the state and for advocates and researchers. It'll make it easier for us to move cases across counties because people move a lot in this, in this um, state. They move across county lines so often. So being able to easily transfer them across those county lines is going to be super critical to be able to um, help them stay covered and not drop off. And then finally, I just want to mention a little bit more about immigration. Um, when SB 75 was enacted a few years ago, we got a very generous grant from the California Healthcare Foundation for our association to partner with some other um, agencies and the state departments to do significant training for our eligibility workers. And we felt really great about how SB 75 went. There is something called a batch process. It's automated, trying to move all those cases um, from undocumented um, and limited scope into full scope coverage. That worked, but about half of them fell out. They're about 40 to 50 percent. Uh, for some reason, um, the computers burped, and we had to get in there, and we really had to manually work those cases, and we were able to prioritize them and get them in in a very short space of time. We felt very good about it. So that'll be something that we'll need to think about um, for whatever expansion is enacted this year as well to try to recreate some of those efforts because computers and batch processes are never 100%. Somebody's going to burp and there's going to be um, cases that we need to do in a manual way. Um, in addition, um, you may have heard about public charge. And this is a proposed set of rule changes at the federal level that is having a significant chilling effect and has the potential to continue to do so, not just in the Medi-Cal program, but in other programs as well that we operate, such as CalFresh. This is really aimed at individuals who are here legally but who may want to change their immigration status um, to uh, become, uh, to get a green card or uh, change their visa status are the two primary ways. And so we don't know what's going to happen with that uh, rule, but it will certainly complicate efforts to increase enrollment among immigrants in general, um, whether they're eligible for full scope now or not, or affect how we're able to roll out those expansions. Even though public charge isn't aimed at undocumented immigrants, People don't understand public charge. It's very complex. The rules are ex incredibly complex. And we're seeing across the board individuals who it may or may not ever affect calling and saying, disenroll me, or I don't want to have you consider me. I think we would expect and need to figure out how to combat that in things like the rollout of coverage to undocumented individuals. So that's it for me. I got the one minute sign, so I think I'm right on time. We'll look forward to your questions. I think we do have time for that. So thank you. We do have about 10 minutes for questions. The important thing with questions is we do have a significant amount of people uh, both on the phone and watching online. So if you have a question, if you can just raise your hand, we'll have uh, one of our folks come um, to you with a microphone. While you're formulating your questions and we're getting ready for those, I might just uh, start one uh, for uh, Margaret and Kathy. Uh, you mentioned uh, potential coverage expansion and the significant effort that needs to go into that to get folks that are newly eligible enrolled. And we also know that there's about a half a million or 550,000 people who are already eligible for the program but not enrolled. Where does the responsibility lie and what are some of the activities that are going on right now at the state and county level to let folks know that they have coverage and they can get enrolled? And on the same line, along the same lines, what happens when a new population is added? What are the outreach efforts that take place? You go ahead. Okay, I'll start. Thanks, Margaret. This is Kathy. I don't know, can people see me? Is it like a webinar or are they just listening? Okay, hi people out there in space. Um, so sure, I think those are really excellent questions. With the Affordable Care Act, which was the hugest ex, you know, expansion that I think any of us are likely to see, given that we are now pared down to that half a million or so people who are eligible but not enrolled, it was millions before that, and then we created this whole new expansion population. I think a number of things happen. I think it really requires outreach and messaging at all levels, and it really matters um, working with the community-based organizations who are out there in each county to temper the messaging. And I think for the general sort of you're eligible but not enrolled, you can think about ways to have um, 
outstation workers, outstation county staff, or community-based organizations that are sort of working with you to try to grab people where they are. I mean, who are those half a million people, and how can we find them at a job fair, or at a food bank, or at wherever, wherever else they might show up to make sure, and remember, I just don't think that's necessarily a static group of 500,000, because even though we now do this rolling eligibility, we've changed the way we re do redeterminations, so we're looking first at what we've got to see if somebody's eligible, that people still fall off the program for whatever reason. So, so trying to be sort of consistent with the messaging, have all of this information available, and have sort of the cadre of people who might meet those folks where they are, be able to get that word out. On the immigration expansion in particular, it's going to be really important to have that same issue. And I think the messaging will be critical and working with health providers, clinics in particular, where a lot of those individuals might receive care today, to try to explain, here's the new rules, here's why it's so critical to have that health coverage, and even though you're scared, you know, this is what you're eligible for, and when you're covered, you and your family, statistics show, are that much healthier, you're that much more likely to get in to see the doctor when the older, like when the parents are covered, the kids go to the doctor more. So trying to use some of those messages and also employ media in the languages that people read and, and speak, not just, you know, kind of us at the county office. We gotta get out there, we gotta partner with people. I think it's a great question, uh, and in addition to, to Kathy's comments, I, I would just mention two additional themes. So currently, uh, the Department of Healthcare Services, in collaboration with counties, is, is working on, has been working on an initiative called the Whole Person um, Care Pilot Program. In conjunction with and in collaboration with counties, the whole person care pilot programs are designed to enhance outreach to the hard to serve populations. So we're really focused in these whole person care pilot programs, we're really focused on homeless beneficiaries, on beneficiaries with severe mental health issues, behavioral health issues, et cetera. The other program that DHCS is rolling out now with the plans that are in the Medi-Cal delivery system is called the Health Home Program, similarly designed to target very, very complex populations that aren't really accessing care. So on the whole person care pilot front, whole person care pilots that are operational in now many, many counties, um, what we're finding is, is that there are many homeless individuals or home persons with housing instability or at risk of homelessness who really are in fact eligible but have never accessed services. So through the force of these programs and this incredible collaboration at the local level that the whole person care program requires and, and in fact, you know, it, it helps to promote collaboration, we're finding people who don't even know that they're eligible for Medi-Cal. So we're getting them to the county to get them eligibleized, get them enrolled in the program. What we're finding through the whole person care program is that, again, this whole issue of outreach related to touching the who, that is to say, who's eligible for Medi-Cal. So that whole element of outreach is probably going to be a very significant focus for us in the near term. Because in the whole person care pilot programs, lots of them have found, for example, that they're hiring people with lived experience. They're going to homeless camps, they're going to food banks, as Christoph said, and they're really working in a completely different way to connect to populations who need the services that Medi-Cal offers, demonstrably need the services, but either are not yet enrolled or are enrolled and don't know how to access care. That brings me to a second theme, and Christoph, it wasn't your question, um, but we do, I think, face an issue in Medi-Cal 
even for those who are appropriately enrolled in the program. They have gone to the county. They have become eligible. They have their card. They are enrolled in a health care, um, a managed health care plan for their services, and yet do not always access the care to which they are entitled. So I think that we face two themes here, you know, outreach to ensure people are appropriately enrolled in a program to which they are entitled, but yet also outreach to ensure that the populations are really accessing the care that is available to them in the program. Um, I think we're going to see a lot more um, dependence and reliance on persons with lived experience to really communicate authentically with some of the populations that are really complex at risk of homelessness, housing instability. I think we'll see health plans using navigators more aggressively and perhaps counties working with health plans to use and avail themselves of navigators more effectively so that we actually touch and connect with the who that is now eligible for this great program. Great question, thank you. Thank you both, there's a lot there and you unpacked it very nicely. We have a question here. Hello, uh, Daniela Warniso with the Department of Social Services. Thank you both for everything you're telling us. Um, so my question really aligns with this conversation, um, specifically with the native population based on your charge less than 1% of individuals are of American Indian or Alaska Native, and what are we lacking or what's happening with our outreach efforts that we are not reaching this population effectively? I don't have the magic bullet. Um, I wish I did. That's a great question. I do think that, um, and this is something that we see in the child welfare area as well, our population of Native Americans is a little different um, in general in California from some other states and that we have such a large urban Indian population that it can be, I think, a little more difficult to partner with the tribes. That doesn't mean we shouldn't try and shouldn't do that. Um, the last time I was in this room was actually um, for a, a celebration for my son's old um, child care, which was run by, it's run by a tribe here, the Buena Vista Rancheria. And I think making sure that you, again, meet people where they are, opportunities such as gatherings where people do come together is really critical. I think we do have, like in Sacramento, some very good providers, some clinics that really focus on the Native American population and thinking about ways to ensure that they're really putting front and center try to enroll in this program, let's see if you're eligible for this program um, in places where you w are able to really talk to folks who are members of tribes, um, I think is, is really critical. That's kind of my initial take. I, I agree with uh, Kathy completely. I think that um, the, the question is, uh, like Christoph's initial volley to us, you know, quite profound really. It is the imperative to, in my view, um, think differently and much more proactively about outreach. You know, again, I always think about Medi-Cal from the historical perspective. And again, having, you know, it started in 65 as an entitlement program. Uh, and again, a wonderful history as an entitlement program, but we really are at that juncture now where, again, given the fact that the WHO serves a third of Californians and the scope of services is so broad, I think we really do face uh, an important challenge in terms of thinking differently about engagement. And when we think about engagement, I think we have to think about engagement not only in terms of specific communities and specific needs and individuals, of course, who are entitled to this care. But I think we have to think differently about promoting Medi-Cal literacy broadly. This event is a perfect example of promoting what I think of as Medi-Cal literacy broadly because this is a program that is valuable to California very broadly more broadly now than it ever was historically. So uh, today is an example of promotion of true Medi-Cal literacy that I think we should all be indebted to the foundation for. I hope that came somewhat close to being responsive. 
Um, my name is Terry Gehring. I'm a social worker at UC Davis Medical Center. And could you speak a little bit, and you might do it later, about the share of cost um, with some Medi-Cal plans? Because a lot of the patients, it seems very um, not, not feasible. So is there ways for them to reduce their share of cost so they are income eligible without it? Because it's just very cost prohibitive. And yeah, then the, also, at some point, could you speak to if straight Medi-Cal, the advantages and disadvantages for patients um, versus a managed Medi-Cal plan, and if that's still going, moving forward, is that still an option for patients? Uh, sh sure, I can certainly tackle the first question. So we didn't get into all the details due to time, but if your income is too high, you can still become Medi-Cal eligible you just have a share of cost in that program. So you would, depending on your percentage, and you can go back to the slide, I think it might be up actually, you know, sort of depending on your percentage of income and where you are above, essentially your share of cost is the amount that you're over. So say you're $200 above the income, you'd have a $200 share of cost. And how that works is in any given month, you have to meet the share of cost before Medi-Cal will cover anything. And every month it resets. So it's unwieldy. I mean, it's, it's, not a, it's not a great first option for people. It may be good as a backup for individuals who have very high costs and high needs and their incomes are just too high. I will say that one population that we're really looking at related to this is the aged and disabled. This is part of sort of the old rules of Medi-Cal for whom people over 64, 65 and above, the ACA largely didn't touch. It, basically, they stay the same in their eligibility. And small differences in income for them can actually put them above the income limit. And then they can get a very large share of cost because of the way the rules are. It's a little counterintuitive. Um, but it has become, I think, an issue for the state. There have been some efforts over the past couple of legislative sessions to smooth that out, to increase the percentage to try to reduce the number of people who are actually affected by the share of cost piece. And I think, um, I mean, our association supports those efforts, especially to try to bring things more in line with those under 65 and have similar coverage for them. Obviously, those are individuals who are also eligible for Medicare. So thinking about the sort of interaction between the two programs is critical. But trying to reduce the number of people covered with a share of costs is certainly a critical conversation that I think needs to be had. Um, your other question was managed care versus fee-for-service. Um, I'll kick most of this to Margaret, and I think you will talk about this later. But just to say there's a significant percentage now, the, the vast, vast majority of our uh, customers, our beneficiaries are enrolled in managed care, and there's some really good reasons for that. I think that'll be a topic of conversation for the for a good chunk of the rest of the day. The issue with fee-for-service can be, um, frankly, finding the provider who's willing to provide the services to you. There's not a directory. You kind of just have to pick up the phone and start calling, and that can be really difficult for people, especially if they have some other impairments, and that also translates over to the behavioral health side where it can be difficult to find as well, and so now we either have managed managed care responsible for some section of the behavioral health to also connect you with those services or the county behavioral health um, department to do that. And that's, you know, better than having to just call on your own. So I think there's a reason why we moved to managed care for such an enormous uh, percentage of our population because it would just be so difficult for millions and millions of people to be able to find the services otherwise. That question sets up our, our second panel so nicely, but I'll let Margaret jump in Thank and you. have the last word. <laughs> I was going to say the same thing. Um, your, timing, your timing and your question is perfect. Uh, as Kathy indicated, historically, historically the Medi-Cal program was a fee-for-service program, meaning I'm eligible, I have my card, I go find, and I'm, a, I'm my own manager, I find my care. Um, California began to do uh, and to transition to a managed care delivery system many years ago, but in the last, post-ACA, um, managed care became California's primary delivery system. So we have 13.2 million Californians receiving care from Medi-Cal, about 10 million of those beneficiaries, maybe a little less, but close to 10 million receive their care through one of California's managed care plans. 
that plan through which I, a beneficiary, an enrollee, a customer, get my care, that plan has obligations to have a call center, to track quality, to promote care coordination, to work with the counties and the county delivery system. Um, I don't think it's responsive necessarily to your question. You'll have more in the next session. The next iteration, I think, of managed care for the Medi-Cal program will be surrounding that idea of even greater coordination with the county delivery systems, with mental health, with the IHSS program, um, and, and with the drug Medi-Cal program and substance use disorder services. Integration and really being coordinated, if you will, no wrong door at the delivery system level, will I think be our next mutual challenge. But it's perfectly timed, thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. Please join me in, in thanking uh, Kathy and Margaret for this wonderful panel.